made you decide to be done with church? It's like, for me, it's like, I can recognize that this is just not it for me. Cool. This, this building and maybe even the idea of assembling, you know, to, I would say engaging my father like this is just not it for me. I just feel like me going and wanting to be a part of a church and mold myself into the church has scarred me to the point where I don't want to go. So you give your all to the church and then the church does not, was it recognized that you also may be hurting? And I did not feel like I could go to anyone there um, and that the relationships that I had with these people we're church relationships. Like we can be good and we can uh, be happy and we can sing hymns together and learn together. But like when the rubber hit the road and I was going through trauma, like, no, this is not safe. I can't talk about this with these people. Cause right now, just in me and my, convi in my convictions, I don't believe it's necessary to meet in the building where I could like have brothers and sisters um, in the room with me in Christ um, and we are the church so I think it's just recognizing what does church really mean for you and can you find Christ in or outside of it church now is a spiritual connection with God recognizing who he is and what he is in my life and still doing the work of a Christian by reading my Bible praying to God um, I still tell people about God Mm. I just don't go into a building. Mm. I don't, I don't, I, I recognize with 2020, I don't need the building to be a Christian. We live in a day and time where more people are deciding they are done with church. They're just finished. And I'm not talking about pandemic habits, or as my family called it, pajama church, right? the church of pancakes. I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about people who are opting out of the church altogether. Uh, the Pew Research Center did an exhaustive study of millennials. Now millennial, that term is defined differently in different circles, but a millennial is basically someone who today is aged 25 to 40, and the study of the Pew Center research showed that four out of ten millennials describe themselves as completely non-religious. This is four times higher than it was when I went to high school in the 1980s. This is the fastest decline of religious affiliation ever recorded in history. Older generations are declining in religious affiliation as well, but at a slower rate. Generations younger than millennials may be declining even faster. And part of what lies behind the decline in religious affiliation is, of course, in part, the fact that fewer people are growing up in church. Uh, we have, for the first time in American history, the first truly unchurched generation growing up. They didn't go to Sunday school. They didn't learn the songs. They didn't learn the Bible stories. Um, someone this morning told me a story, a true story. Uh, she's a teacher. And one of her colleagues who taught kindergarten would routinely ask kids to bring in books and then the teacher would read the books to the kids. And one December, a child brought in a book about Christmas, about the birth of baby Jesus. And the kindergarten teacher read the book to her class, even though she probably wasn't supposed to. And one of the kids said, I, I don't get why they named the baby a swear word. True story. People just don't know what they don't know. They're growing up completely unchurched. That's part of it. But then there's another side of people who did grow up in church, who did go to Sunday school, who learned the songs and the stories, and were part of small groups, and maybe even were in church leadership, who are deciding that they are done with church. They are deconstructing. And we'll talk about that term more in just a moment. Now you probably did not need me to tell you that this morning. You didn't need to hear statistics because you know this is happening all around us. It's happening in your family and in mine. And when you love and are committed to the church and someone you know is disconnecting, uh, it, it can be painful. It is for me. 
Jesus is the most important person in my life and my relationship to God through Jesus Christ has been a source of stability and guidance and confidence for me. It's been my anchor in times uh, of the storms of life. And I think everybody would be better with Jesus than without Jesus. I don't want to see anybody walk away from that, but I also get it. The church of Jesus, the body of Christ, hasn't always looked like Jesus. So if you love somebody who's done with church or done with Jesus, this series is for you. This series is also for you if you are done with church or nearly done with church or thinking about being done with church, this is for you as well and I'm honored that you would even listen in. So I want you to tell you about the, the sermon topics we're going to look at over the next five Sundays uh, and tell you how we arrived at these. Uh, we wanted to know the reasons people have for being done with church. So we asked around, does anybody know anybody who's done with church? And they did. And we passed the word and nearly 150 people responded to a written survey. And then a handful of people agreed to be interviewed by Terrence Gray. And some of those agreed to be interviewed on camera and to have excerpts of their interviews uh, played here on Sunday mornings. And we'll be playing those throughout the next five Sundays. Now most of the respondents were and had no uh, ever historical connection to Ward Church. Not because it's not happening here, it is, but because sometimes people are more honest when it's a few layers removed. And so a lot of people we talk to live in other states and uh, some of them were even uh, former ministry people. And when we say done with church, of course we mean the church capital C, the big church, all the churches. And we talk about deconstruction or done with church, we're talking primarily about the American church. Uh, there is no parallel trend in South America or Africa or Asia. This is a uniquely Western trend right now. So when we say done with church, we are talking in this series about the American evangelical church. And here's the topics we're going to respond to over the next five Sundays. This is what we heard. The church mishandles politics. The church hurt me. The church represses women. The church only cares about itself. The church is racially segregated. Now I think if we had done this series a decade ago, the questions would have been different. I think a decade ago, the questions would have been those standard all-time intellectual objections of the faith about, you know, science and the Bible. And could Jesus, who was dead, actually rise again? And can the Bible be trusted? And those kind of questions. And I, I still believe those questions are out there. Those are fair thinking person questions. I believe those questions are out there, but it's not what anybody said this time. Those questions of old aren't top of mind right now. The questions that are top of mind are, are, are more uh, emotional, more subjective, and for a church leader, they feel more personal. And it'd be very easy as someone who loves and is committed to the church to get defensive. And I'm going to ask us, not to. Uh, when someone criticizes the church, you know, for me, I, I feel like someone just told me my baby is ugly and all my defenses go up. But here's the spirit of this. We're going to listen to each, for each critique, we're going to lean in and listen. And where the critique has merit, we want to own it, confess it, and get better. And where the critique does not have merit or it's based on a misconception, we want to clarify it. So that overall, the whole purpose of this is that we will, we will better represent Jesus. Because that's the idea of the church. We are, in, we are to represent Jesus in this world. And so to the extent where we're uh, not representing Jesus well, you know, we, we want to, uh, uh, that, that's on us. And to the extent that uh, we are representing Jesus and we're still getting pushback, then that's on them. Right? Everyone got the spirit of this? Before we get to the issue of the day, I want to talk a little more about deconstruction. That term may or may not be familiar to you, deconstruction. It's really a literary uh, device, a literary theory. Uh, it was used to deconstruct literary works. 
and to reassemble them with meaning drawn from the culture and experience of the reader. Deconstruction means to take apart and to re-examine and to uncover flaws and inconsistencies. That's a literary theory. Now apply that to Christianity. Christianity, uh, Christian deconstruction means to take apart, to examine, to uncover flaws and inconsistencies in the faith that I hold, in the Christian subculture of which I am a part, and in the church to which I belong. Kristen Sanders, in her cover story in the March issue of Christianity Today, all about deconstruction, she defines deconstruction as the struggle to correct or deepen a naive belief. The struggle to correct or deepen naive belief. So this can be a really good thing for us. Bless you. And the, uh, the, the cover story on Christianity Today simply said, you're not deconstructing? Like, isn't everybody deconstructing right now? And the subtitle, Why the Evangelical Buzzword Might Just Renew Your Love for Good Theology. This can be a really good thing. It's not to be feared. And it is at a level now, people are calling it a movement, a deconstruction movement. Let's talk about two approaches being used in deconstruction. This might be helpful. Approach number one, using scripture to critique the church. This is essentially what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would repeatedly say, you have heard it said, but I say. Right? When what you've heard said and what you're practicing and what you're doing actually is not in the Bible at all. It's from your tradition and in some places it's actually contrary to the scriptures. Let, let's get back to God's intent for human life as revealed in the Bible. That's number one. Number one is essentially what Martin Luther and the reformers did in the 16th century. They used the Bible to critique the church. And when we do this number one well, it leads to reformation. It leads to a stronger, healthier, more resilient, more robust faith. And a stronger, more resilient, more robust church. I would encourage number one. Number two, a little different form of deconstruction, using culture to critique the scripture. In classic deconstruction, meaning can change based on the person's experience and culture. So it's highly subjective. So people come to the Bible, they come to the way of Jesus with preconceived ideas about morality, and the Bible and the church don't line up. They're using culture to critique the scripture. I think this is way more subjective and uh, therefore way more dangerous. It can be anything you want. I would encourage number one, caution about number two, and if you are someone who's deconstructing, it might be helpful to ask, which approach are you taking or is it a combination of the two? It might also be helpful to distinguish between deconstruction and deconversion. Some people are rethinking, re-examining their way right out of faith altogether. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus anymore. But the people we talked to said they do believe in God. They do believe in Jesus. They just can no longer believe in the church. Our survey respondent, uh, our survey asked, does being done with church mean that you are done with God? And 90% of survey respondents said no. Being done with church is not being done with God. It's also possible that some people who are done with church are only temporarily done with church because 34% of respondents who are done with church said they would come to church if invited by somebody. That's very surprising. 34% said they would respond to an invitation. So it's possible your friends who are done with church, what they're really saying is they are done for now. Some are done forever, some are done for now. We can uh, define it this way. Christian deconstruction is careful, re uh, careful examination of one's beliefs to reveal areas of faith and function that are unlike Christ. Uh, as opposed to deconversion, Christian deconversion, which is removal from and rejection of Christianity. So is it possible to deconstruct without deconverting? Yes, this is my whole point. And, and using these definitions, in fact, these definitions, we all should be deconstructing at some level. Because all of us as individuals have areas of faith and function that are unlike Christ. And every church in the world has areas of faith and function that are unlike Christ. So in this way, seeking deconstruction 
is a call for reformation. Now, the topic of today, one of the things we heard repeatedly, uh, people who are done with church say things like this. They say the church mishandles politics, or they phrase it this way, the church is too political. Now, not all of you agree with this statement. In fact, some of you I know believe quite the opposite, that the church isn't political enough, that this nation has lots of problems, and this is a time we should be calling Christians to political action. But the people who are leaving the church are saying that faith and politics got commingled in unhealthy ways, especially recently, and it's actually pushed people away from the church. Today I'd like to offer some affirmations and confessions. Some affirmations and confessions. And I'd like to back into the topic um, this way. I believe that I live in the greatest country in the world. There's no place in the world I would rather live than the United States of America. Yeah. I, uh, I vote in every election. I stand at the national anthem. I even get teary-eyed. I'm so grateful that I get to live here. Now that does not mean that I am blind to the problems of our nation. We are far from perfect. Uh, and I know that I can't be fully objective. Um, I, I, I would hope that every person in the world has an affection for their homeland the way I have an affection for mine. I know I can't be completely objective, and I know this because I also believe that I live in the best state in the United States of America. There's no place like Michigan. And I know a lot of you uh, agree that Michigan's the greatest state in August. And... Uh, yeah, I was born and raised here, and I know I can't be completely objective about that. I believe that my wife is the greatest wife in the world. Am I being completely objective about that? Yes, I am! <laughs> I'm being subjectively objective. Yeah, and I would hope that every married man here believes his wife is the best wife in the world, and that every married woman here believes her husband is the best husband in the world. And my wife Angie said to me recently, not just I'm the best husband in the world, she said to me, you're the best man in the world. There's no way she could believe that. It's really a ridiculous statement. She knows that's not true. She knows my flaws. The best man in the world, that's, that's, that's ridiculous, uh, untrue. Uh, she, she couldn't really believe that, but at another level, she does believe it. My highest allegiance is not to my wife, and I got her permission to say that. My highest allegiance is not to the state of Michigan. My highest allegiance is not to the United States of America. I, I love my wife. I love my state. I love my nation. I submit myself to my nation and to my state and to my wife. I am a man under authority. But my highest allegiance I have given to a king named Jesus, and he ushered in a whole different kind of kingdom, an upside-down kingdom. And this is what got Christians in trouble with Rome in the first century. It was their allegiance. Rome didn't care who you worshipped or what you believed. They couldn't give a rip about the many different religious beliefs within their vast empire. It wasn't the beliefs of the Christians that got them in trouble. It was this language of allegiance and kingship and king that made them an enemy of the state. One of the earliest Christian confessions, very short, it was just, Jesus is Lord. It's one of the earliest confessions of the Christians. And that word Lord, back in that day, really only had two uses. It was used of a slave master by his slaves. And it was used by everybody of the emperor. The emperor is Lord. And Christians said, Jesus is Lord, and Rome heard that as a political statement. Christians were saying, our highest allegiance is not to the emperor, but to Jesus. We follow a different king and a different kingdom, and that's when Christianity was outlawed. 
The writer of Hebrews is looking back at some of the great men and women of faith in the Bible. Some of you know the, the famous uh, Hall of, of Faith um, in Hebrews 11. And as the writer looks back, this is what he says about those people. He's picking up some of the same idea. All these people of great faith were still living by faith when they died. They were faithful to the end. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers. They were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. These great men and women of faith, they, they, they knew they were foreigners here. They didn't quite fit in. Their home was somewhere else. Part of the reason you don't feel like you fit in is because this is not your ultimate home. Part of the reason you feel like you don't belong fully is because you don't. And this brings us to our first affirmation. As Christians, our primary allegiance is to Jesus and our primary citizenship is in heaven. Now I think everybody here could affirm this statement. But it doesn't solve the issue of the day, does it? Because it's helpful to declare our primary allegiance. But the problem is we also have secondary allegiances. And sometimes it's hard to be faithful to all the things going on in our life. We want to we uh, really care about our city, our nation, and our state, as well as the kingdom of God. Pastor Tim Keller uh, writes this. He says, Christians cannot pretend they can transcend politics and simply, quote, preach the gospel... Those who avoid all political discussions and engagements are essentially casting a vote for the status quo. Right, we don't want the status quo. We want better. And God will call people of faith to cast a vote, to lobby for a candidate, to run for political office, to sign a petition, to start a petition, to get active in political process so that we don't settle for the status quo but so that we can do better as a city, as a state, and as a nation. Uh, Christians ought to be involved in politics. But that's not the critique that's being lobbed. Uh, right? The accusation isn't that Christians should never be involved in politics anywhere. I don't know anyone who has ever said that. The Christians should never be involved in politics. The accusation is that we, the church, have commingled politics and faith in ways that deviate from the way of Jesus. Is that fair? Let's look at the way of Jesus. Uh, remember uh, the story in the Gospels where, where Jesus is tempted by Satan three times in the wilderness. And the third temptation was this one. Finally, the devil took Jesus up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms on earth and their power the kingdoms of the world and their power. And the devil said to him, I will give all this to you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, go away, Satan. The scriptures say, love the Lord your God and serve him alone. But this is one of the great temptations common to all men. We're tempted to put our trust in the kingdoms of this world and their power power. Even before Jesus, this was a biblical warning conveyed in the Psalms and elsewhere. One of the Psalms says this, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And then very similarly, Psalm 20 carries this uh, sentiment. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. Those were the military vehicles of that day. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Right? We trust in the Lord our God. It's a very common temptation to put our trust in the wrong places. So can we make this confession today? We have fumbled to live in the tension between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. We want to be a good citizen of the kingdom of God first and foremost and we want to be good citizens of the kingdoms of this world and there's this tension and we do not always manage the tension well. Let's take it farther. 
We have fumbled to live in the, uh, let me go back. Let me get that first part here. We fumbled to live in the tension between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. Let's take it farther. Go. We have sought the kingdoms of this world and their power rather than seeking first the kingdom of God. We have trusted in princes and in chariots rather than in the name of the Lord our God. You might not be ready to make these confessions, but I am. I've done these things. I've been part of churches that have done these things. Some of you may remember that my story uh, when I was young, a young man, I, I actually initially intended to be a lawyer. That's what my high school yearbook says. That's what I went to college for. I studied pre-law. I, I didn't want to be a trial attorney. I wanted to be a legislator or work for a legislator. At 18 years of age, I wanted to change the world and I was full of young, naive optimism. When I was 18 years old, I ran as a precinct delegate. You have to be 18 years to be a precinct delegate. Oh, so I waited till my birthday and I filed the papers and my name was on the ballot for the uh, August primary election. And I made a flyer with my mom's typewriter and some clip art and I had them for Kinko's. I had photocopied at Kinko's and I went door to door. My name is Scott McKee and I want to be your next precinct delegate. And a lot of the homeowners ask the question that some of you are wondering right now, what is a precinct delegate? <laughs> and I had to say, I'm not entirely sure, but I will be the best delegate that you've ever had. And youthful optimism ruled the day and I won the election by a landslide. By a landslide. I, I ran unopposed. <laughs> but still the 27 people who vote in an office like this all voted for me. Now that tells you what kind of kid I was because I knew I was running unopposed and I still went door to door. My name's Scott McKee and I'm going to change the world. And the way you change the world, I reasoned at that time, was you change the laws. Now to make a, a long story less long, over time I came to believe that the way you really change the world is not by changing the law, but by changing the human heart. And only God can change the human heart. And so instead of going to law school, I went to seminary, and the rest is history. Now, my story is not a dig on attorneys. We need uh, good uh, attorneys and, and doctors and accountants and engineers and electricians and truck drivers. We need people of goodwill informed by their faith in all vocations and occupations uh, because let's face it, Christian pastors are a dime a dozen. We need Christians in all walks of life each one of us called by God to a certain vocation. This is not about vocation. But can we affirm more broadly that Jesus' strategy for changing the world was not through political process or military power, but through humble, self-giving, self-sacrificing love? The disciples of Jesus did not buy into this completely. They heard all the sermons of Jesus about peace and love and sacrifice and humility, but they still thought at some point Jesus would power up and kick out the Romans because that's what Messiah is supposed to do, they thought. Bring a new kingdom. Bring freedom. And they did not understand that the kingdom of Jesus and the freedom of Jesus was so much higher and so much wider. And we know the disciples didn't understand it because the scripture records things they say, sometimes comical, that show that they, they, just, they didn't understand the way of Jesus. Uh, for example, there's this conversation recorded where Jesus knows his life is coming to an end and he's journeying toward Jerusalem where he will meet the cross. And his disciples are traveling with him and he's talking to them. He's, say, he's saying things to them when they travel, uh, things like, you must deny yourselves. You must pick up your cross and follow me. He even told them the Son of Man is going to suffer greatly. He was telling them what's going on, but they, they have to pass through Samaria to get to Jerusalem, and they get to a city that will not give them lodging. 
which is a real snub in a culture that honors hospitality. They won't open their house to them. And so th this, is, this is the line from that story. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, that they wouldn't give them hospitality, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? <laughs> Jesus is like, no! Have you, have you not been paying attention in class? It says, G Jesus turned and rebuked them. What? <laughs> We're not calling down fire. That's not my way. My way is different. Even in the garden on the night on which Jesus was betrayed, when people came to him with swords to take him away, and even the disciples, maybe in that moment they thought, maybe this is where Jesus is going to throw down. The apostle Peter was there that night, and this is what he remembers. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Follow in the steps of Jesus. Jesus committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, and this is beautiful, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. What if we followed the tone and practice of our Savior? Jesus washed feet, he served others, he laid down his life, and he gave a new commandment, love each other as I have loved you. And this leads to another confession. We have not always followed the strategy for world change modeled and taught by Jesus. We've not followed the strategy modeled and taught by Jesus. The early Christians sowed seeds that would topple the Roman Empire. And they did it by gathering on the first day of the week for worship, by pledging their allegiance to Jesus as king, by serving their neighbors. They, 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 would, they would rescue babies from trash piles and bring them to safety and raise those babies as their own. They would care for the sick in ways that even put their own lives at risk. They refused to pick up the weapons of this world. And I heard someone say the reason we don't follow the strategy of Jesus is because deep down, we don't think it will work. Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Anybody know what happens to sheep among wolves? It's not pretty. I mean, what a, what a horrible recruitment slogan of Jesus. I'm going to send you out like sheep among wolves. We want, to be, we want to be the wolves. We want to be sent out in power. The church always looks better when we are defending the powerless rather than seeking our own power. For the, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Tim Keller, I quoted him earlier. Here he is on politics again. Tim Keller says, When the church as a whole is seen no longer as speaking to questions that transcend politics, and when it is no longer united by a common faith that transcends politics, then the world sees strong evidence that Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx were right, that religion is really just a cover for people wanting to get their way in the world. And this is the suspicion held by a lot of people who are done with church. Earlier this morning, Rick read for us the Beatitudes, the, the start of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. And several years ago, a college professor put together a Bible study made up of non-Christian Bible students who were just curious to know what the Bible actually said. And they got to this part of the Bible, the Beatitudes, and they're reading this. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful. And one of the guys in the group says to the prof, do people know this is in here? 
Do people know this is here? And the professor says, you know, actually it's one of the most famous teachings of Jesus. And the student said, see if I had to put together a list of the polar opposite characteristics of what I've seen in the church, this would be it. That's not fair. I don't think that's true. Polar opposite of the church is the Beatitudes of Jesus. That's, that's not fair. It's not true. Here's what is true. We can do better. We can represent Jesus better. We can follow Jesus better. We can follow. So let us renew our allegiance to Jesus as King, deny ourselves, and follow Him. This strategy changed the world once, and it can do so again. Will you stand and pray with me? Well, oh God, forgive us the times that we have sought the kingdoms of this world and their power rather than seeking first the kingdom of God. Give us wisdom to know how to be the best citizens and the best neighbors in our city, state, nation, and world. May we represent Jesus well. We pray this morning your blessing on the church of Jesus Christ in all of its forms all around the world. And we pray for the kind of deconstruction that, that brings reformation and purity and faithfulness. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. I know a lot more could be said about this topic and that anything I've offered today uh, is inadequate. And I want to promise the same level of inadequacy for the remainder of the series. And, uh, and, I, and I want to thank you for being the kind of congregation that can engage at this level because not every congregation can. And I want you to know how grateful uh, I am for that. Next week, we'll lift up The Church Hurt Me. And I think it's going to be a healing time for a lot of you and a lot of others. Until then, receive this benediction. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you.